This story is brought to you by the all-wheel drive Subaru Impreza. Get a grip. His last chance. A missing politician. The case reopened. The number one Scandi crime sensation. From the screenwriter of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. The Keeper of Lost Causes. In cinemas July 31. Hello, I'm Ricardo Gonsalves. An Egyptian brokered ceasefire in the conflict in Gaza is looking unlikely. Israel has accepted the proposal, but Hamas says the conditions of the truce signify surrender. We are encouraged that Egypt has made a proposal to accomplish this goal, which we uh, hope can restore the calm that we've been seeking. Rockets have since been fired from Gaza. Jared Baden Clay has been sentenced to life in prison. The jury found him guilty of murdering his wife and dumping her body in a muddy creek in Brisbane two years ago. We, Alison's family and friends, are relieved that we finally have justice for Alison. The Senate has begun debating the carbon tax tonight, but a final vote isn't expected until tomorrow at the earliest, and World Cup winners Germany have landed in Berlin. We'll have another update shortly. Welcome everybody, good to have you with us tonight. Um, Philip, four years ago, how well could you see? Ah, Jenny, I couldn't see very well at all. Um, I had a growth, uh, the, there was a failure of the stem cells and so like a veil, the, um, the covering on, on my iris was gradually coming down in an opaque sense. And this was your right eye? It was my right eye mm -hmm. and things were getting dimmer and dimmer. Now, you had to retire early because of this, is that right? Uh, uh, yes, I did, and then I subsequently went back to work. Tell us what you had done to your right eye in 2010. I had my cornea scraped off, and then I had stem cells that were taken from my left eye and grown up uh, by a very talented medical researcher sitting next to me and a team of other capable people put onto my right eye, whereupon... Uh, I grew a new cornea in my right eye. And how well can you see now? I can see you very well. I can see you wearing two earrings. I can see you holding a pen. I can see everything. Mm. And you've gone back to work? Uh, I did go back to work, but last year I retired seriously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nick, you're the, the researcher who was involved in this. Explain what you did to help Philip. Um, so... Basically what we did was we took multiple biopsies and these are like one millimetre in diameter from his healthy eye and we put these biopsies um, on contact lenses and we put those lenses in a solution and put those um, uh, lenses in an incubator so that we could expand the cells from those tiny biopsies. And once those contact lenses became um, confluent with cells and um, Stephanie Watson who performed the surgery, she was able to scrape away all the abnormal cells from Philip's right eye with a scalpel blade, and then we rested that contact lens with the stem cells um, over that eye. So you'd grown that and basically put it on the exactly. eye. Exactly. Was this all part of a clinical trial? It was a clinical trial which was registered. It had un undergone ethics approval from uh, two authorities, the University of New South Wales and the Area Health Service Prince of Wales Hospital. Well, how quickly did you notice the difference? I noticed it quickly enough so that by the time I went down to uh, the south coast for a, a bit of a break, I sat down and I read The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo <laughs> without leaving the chair. How, <laughs> how long was that after the that was operation? Probably about, that was probably two days later. Wow. Yeah. Um, 
Martin Perry, you're the head of the STEM, of STEM Cells Australia, which is a government-funded research initiative. How Explain to people how stem cells can help regrow or repair parts of the body. So stem cells are special cells. They exist in many tissues of the body, and they are able to what we call self-renew, that's divide to form more stem cells. Uh, but they're also capable of what we call differentiation or specialization to give rise to mature cell types. They're, they're like a reserve or reservoir for regeneration and repair of the body. OK, so you can harvest them and potentially use them to treat all sorts of things. That's correct. And, and, and we, we can make stem cells from embryos, or we can convert adult cells now into cells that have properties very like embryonic stem cells, and they can turn into all the tissues of the body. So most things are experimental. They're yeah, not so proven that's, yet. Yes, that's exactly right. So, so most of the stem cell treatments we're talking about are still experimental, meaning we don't yet know whether they're safe and effective in humans. Uh, Carrie Pott asked, you won gold for Australia at the 2000 Olympics in beach volleyball. Uh, what state were your knees in after 20 years of playing <laughs> volleyball? They were in pretty bad state, actually, Jenny. I'd had six knee surgeries that involved ligament ruptures, um, reconstructions, meniscus tears, cartilage pulled off bones. So I had almost everything you could do to a knee, I, I did over those 20 years and I just kept on playing because I loved what I was doing. So how did you end up being treated with stem cells? How did, how did that happen? Well, I got approached by Dr Bright, um, his offices, Macquarie Stem Cells, and I kind of put my hand up and said, yes, I'd be interested in having that done for sure. I, he, he was very clear that it doesn't work for everybody, um, but I, I wanted to have a go because I was at the point where I, I was just going downhill. Did you know it was experimental? Um, I knew it was trialled, being tried, and I knew it was kind of at the beginning of, of the, the procedures, that it'd only been, he'd only been doing it for a couple of years. And what was the treatment itself like? Well, the initial treatment to remove the fat that which they took the stem cells from, which was basically liposuction, wasn't pleasant, and it generally that's not a very pleasant experience. Ralph Bright, you're a cosmetic surgeon. Yes. Um, and you administered Kerry's fat stem cell treatment. You contacted her. Why did you contact her? The, the imperative that, at that time was to help people to become more aware of the existence of stem cells and of the possibility of having this sort of treatment. But was it because she's a high-profile Olympian and, and you were keen to have someone like that? Yes. Yeah. OK, so did she pay for the treatment or was it free? It's free. Did you pay? No. no. OK. Um, Ralph, you're, you were the first person in Australia to treat osteoarthritis with fat stem cells. How did you get started doing this, working with fat stem cells? What, what motivated you mm. as a cosmetic surgeon to start doing it? Um, I'd been doing fat transfer for many, many years, since about 2000. And one of the patients at that time had had a melanoma excised and it looked so darn ugly. And I said, look, don't worry, you've just got a hole there where there's no fat, so I'll just put some fat in there for you. And the first time I did it, because I needed to do it three times to build up the depth, and the first time I did it, she had no feeling whatsoever. The second time I did it, she said, ouch, and the third time I had to use local anaesthetic. And I said, what is in fat that this person should regrow all their nerves? And that's when I started to look at fat and, and to try and find out what was in it. And then I saw the work of um, Bill Walsh at Prince of Wales, and he was growing bone from fat. And I thought that was pretty amazing. Kerry, what happened after your treatment? I'm one year almost to the date now since I had the, the procedure, and my knees are unbelievably fantastic. And I couldn't, I couldn't say that highly enough because an example, just this week, I was at Australia Zoo with my seven-year-old. We were walking around for four hours. Um, I had him on my back at times because he was tired. I then jumped on a plane and came back to, to Sydney and I had no pain, no stiffness. And 18 months ago, I would have been in pain and ha having to take anti-inflammatories and probably wouldn't have been able to walk that much. Clint Bartram, um, you recently had to retire from AFL because of knee problems. We're going to hear a bit about knees tonight. Um, how did you find out about stem cell? 
therapy, about fat stem cell therapy, and I should uh, define this because there are different types of stem cell therapy. How did you find out about this? Yeah, I was at a very similar point to Kerry where uh, my career was uh, being halted by injuries. Uh, this very similar story, I had uh, about six or seven arthroscopes, um, which led to the fact that I, I actually couldn't perform the way I wanted to. Um, the options were either retire, um, again very similar, or, or get a, uh, a partial knee, uh, knee replacement. Um, that wasn't really an option as a 24 year old, so uh, a club doctor, Dan Bates, uh, came to me that, with another option which was stem cells, um, of which I was explained uh, that this procedure still is experimental. Um, but it was something that, I mean, as a professional athlete, you love what you do, and that was something that I was really passionate about, uh, giving myself the best opportunity to uh, potentially get back and play football. Now, again, did you pay for this, or because you're a high-profile footballer, were you approached to have it done? Like, mm. how, did that, how did that work? Uh, so the, f the football club fully supports all their, all their players that are in, uh, in the system. OK, so do you know if they paid for it? No, I'm, I'm unaware. Mm. OK. Um, what were the results like? So I've had partial uh, success. Um, the biggest difference I've actually noticed is this is day to day. Um, for me, uh, I never used to be able to walk without pain. If I was on my feet for more than half an hour, um, my knee would blow up and uh, create quite a lot of swelling. Um, was it enough to get back to playing AFL football? Certainly not. Um, but the success that I did have was um, enough to, to give me a really comfortable life now where I still can be uh, relatively active. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty, pretty impressed with uh, what the stem cells have actually done. OK. Your mm. knees were a bit like Kerry and, and uh, Clint's, yep. although you weren't a professional athlete. Not in the slightest. No, not in the slightest. <laughs> um, how did you hear about fat stem cell therapy? OK, well, I, I was one of those fools that played soccer and squash until I was 52. And I have a radio show every week and I was interviewing Professor Ben Herbert, who's from Regenius, about regenerative mm. medicine. So Which I have a is segment. a company that yeah. deals with stem cells. So I have a segment on the show called Re Regenerative Medicine. I interview Ben every week and have been doing that for the last three years. As a doctor, I thought, yes, this is an experimental uh, therapy. Yes, the, the evidence on the preliminary work has been reasonable. And so I went ahead and had it done because I didn't want to be accused of cells for comment. I paid for it myself. It cost me $10,000 and it did nothing. Didn't, didn't work no, at all? not at all. But let me say in defence of the technique, I was told by a Dr Kwa who did the technique he wasn't confident because my knee was so bad that I actually did need a replacement, but I'm too young for that. So it didn't work for me at all. And you're a cardiologist. I did am. you have any misgivings about having no, a treatment that no, was, it was experimental? It's my own cells. They took 200 grams of abdominal fat. I tried to negotiate for a little bit more. <laughs> and they harvested about 70 million stem cells and injected them back in my knee. And it was my cells, so I thought at the worst it wasn't going to work and I'd lose $10,000. At the best, I'd be out of pain. Uh, Donald Quire and Threadbo, you work uh, with the biggest stem cell company in Australia. You are also Ross's doctor. Um, why do you offer fat stem cell treatment when it's still experimental? Well, I suppose there's, I suppose there's different degrees of uh, experimental, and that's important to note. Um, that there are at least 20 clinical trials available on the use of cell therapy in osteoarthritis. Uh, I'm not sure uh, as certain about uh, other fields. Um, in virtually all of them, they've been safe, uh, and there've been positive results, and on multiple of those studies, there have been uh, MRI changes, findings, uh, or arthroscopic findings to show that there have been positive improvements. What um, uh, some in the panel may uh, want, want is really a level one study where there's double-blinded randomised controlled trials. And now, there are a lot of uh, treatments in medicine that haven't had level one studies passed and are still being done. Uh, I think it really comes down to whether it is safe, and, and I believe it is safe. There was a paper come out in 2011 which was a meta-analysis, uh, which means someone sits down and looks at all the studies in, uh, with respect to stem cell use, and there were 24 studies from memory in that paper, uh, and the uh, uh, conclusion was that it was, uh, it was safe. Are you involved in clinical trials in your work? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I've 
uh, been involved in a publication of a pre-clinical uh, uh, trial uh, that was published in August 2012, uh, looking at the secretions of the cells, because we believe that a lot of the work is done by the secretions. We're also involved in um, the largest and, and the only one in the world of uh, an ethics approved registry. So a lot of these clinical published papers that I spoke about have got numbers of 12 and 20 and 30 uh, patients in their cohort. We've got now over 400 patients in that cohort uh, over uh, two years. Uh, many of those studies were six to 12 months. What are your results showing? In terms of the effectiveness um, of the treatment? Well, we're showing, yeah. So certainly in about 75% of patients, the, uh, they get pain relief at six and 12 months. And that pain relief on average is about 70 to 80%. So we rated patients as responders only if they improved by at least 30% with pain. Okay. Um, Martin Perra, do you think there's solid evidence of the proven effectiveness of some of these stem cell treatments? I think in, in terms of osteoarthritis, the, the evidence is still equivocal. Some studies find benefits, some do not. This is why we need to do these carefully controlled trials, where, where we observe the patients very carefully over a long period of time to really get an idea whether the treatment is safe and effective. John Rasko, what do you think? You, you specialise in bone marrow transplants, which is a, an established area of stem cell treatment. What do you think about this kind of treatment? Well, we know that you do anything to a knee and 30% of people tend to get a little bit better, 30% of people tend to get a little bit worse, and, and the other 30% uh, remain uh, pretty well neutral, and, and God knows what happens to the other 10%. I think that the, bottom line is, the bottom line is that we don't know what happens when we inject these cells or any different types of cells until such time as we do a randomised trial. Ralph, what did you want to say? Just to make the point that um, if you are seeing cartilage growing on X-rays and MRIs, then it's hardly placebo. But you don't know that. You don't know that unless you've got a placebo arm. You know, I mean, I think I'm, I'm also concerned about the use of payment for treatment in this sort of situation. A clinical trial should not have a cost involved in it. And I think it's a very grey area of ethics, personally. But if you could ever see a placebo that's going to grow cartilage, have you, have you ever seen a placebo grow cartilage? I don't think that's... I think the issue is that we need to know that it is of benefit for these patients. And if you're charging people for it, yes, but no. Oh, <laughs> so, but if, if someone had said to me, $20,000 and your knees will be like they feel today, I would have no hesitation but in doing the procedure. Not everyone can afford 20000 Kerry, of course. I agree with you. Know, you and I so, you know, I think we need to know what, whether something And I think works. the point is, uh, the point you're making is about science, right? That you yeah. want the science. We want the science without the, the overcrowding of, of financial incentive involved in it, I mm. think. And do you share that view, Martin? That you I don't do think the science view. is in yes. on fat stem cell therapy or other types of stem cell therapy being offered in Australia as well? Most types of stem cell therapy are still experimental. We don't know, in fact, in many cases whether they're safe. We don't know in many cases whether they're effective. And so how can it be that those therapies are being applied to people? Because they are exempt from the normal regulations that govern cell, cell therapies in this country. And that's because you're allowed to use a patient's own cells. A patient's cells. own cells. Yes. And, and may I point out that the, the application you've hear, heard here, fat cells for oste osteoarthritis, is, is one a lot of us would, would agree is, is a reasonable thing to try. But what's being done goes well beyond that now. And so do you see that as a loophole in the law? I, mean, I do. How, you do? And, and why are you concerned about it being a loophole in the law? Because it opens the door to a whole range of treatments and manipulations that, in fact, may carry real risk and uh, uh, really represent a genuine danger. OK, Donald, what did you want to say? I mean, it, this idea that there's a loophole in the law that's enabling you to use this treatment. Well, it's not a loophole. It's, uh, it's the same as that, that, that loophole that he refers to um, I think John or Martin might have mentioned that, uh, is a biological exemption. It is the same as someone saying that uh, blood transfusions 
is a biological exemption. Ralph, how do you respond to the suggestion you're operating in a loophole? Oh, yeah. Um, good point. The loophole, the word loophole, is a word that comes from Martin and it's not shared by the TGA. The TGA made a very deliberate decision to exempt these cells. It endorses the low-risk nature of the cells that we use as opposed to the high-risk nature of embryonic stem cells and, and the like. John, you're sitting next to Kerry. I mean, she's saying, this worked for me. Absolutely, and I'm certain it did. Um, have, however, what I would say is maybe injecting plasma or normal saline or washing out the joint might have had just exactly the same uh, benefit in another group of people or herself. The point is not to have celebrity endorsements or individual reports. Uh, ultimately, we want to apply the best health we possibly can in our nation to everybody who has a crook joint. And everybody should be allowed to take the benefit of the best that medicine and science has to offer. That's what Australia's health system offers and that's what we all wish to uh, provide. Martin, are your own stem cells safer to use in, in these procedures? I mean, is, that, that is safety proven? Th that depends. Um, as opposed to effectiveness? If we take the example of a red cell transfusion, that's an example in which the patient's own cells are taken, they're not really manipulated much, and they're put right back in to do exactly the same job they would normally be doing. Now, in instances where we take a patient's own cells and uh, manipulate them in the laboratory or grow them, and then we're putting them back to do a completely different job, that entails a good deal more risk. So there's a spectrum of risk here, unquestionably. Uh, and yes, you do have to look at the risk benefit uh, analysis. But the problem is, under the current regulatory framework, uh, this is allowing experimentation to go forward uh, without the appropriate uh, oversight. Just because we don't know the science behind it doesn't mean to say that it doesn't work. Response? That's the definition of pseudoscience. Right there. We just heard the definition of pseudoscience. But science isn't That's absolute either. Quackery, science, that science. is snake oil sales. Closing in on Baghdad, Iraq's coming storm. But can ISIS be stopped? Dateline tonight, 9.30, SBS 1. I like your face. There's just a trace. What looks like to be us in tension. Wild Brazil, tomorrow, 7.30, SBS 1. Touchdown every morning, ten times, not just now and then. Once more on the rise, nuts to the flabby guys. Go, you chicken fat, go away. Go, you chicken fat, go. Run me to run like a tortoise. Okay. Go to float and to soar. Now double up, ready. Buy any LG TV over $1,000 at Bing Lee and get a gift card you can use towards any other LG purchase. Like a new home theatre sound system. That's mind blowing. Come home to King Furniture this winter. Sail on now. Look at all the hotels. Hotels in trees, themed hotels. And now they're up to 40% off. Oh, like this hotel. And this one. It's our global sale. No, not 40% off globes. Up to 40% off hotels. It's out of this world. I'm still actually in this world. Renault Clio, with a five-year unlimited kilometre warranty, 
and cap price servicing. Available now from just $16,990. It's seriously stylish, so you don't have to be. For too long, us Aussies have been suffering from the chippy slap. But not anymore. Smith's new thinly cut chips have 75% less saturated fat. Smith's thinly cut, now available in new resealable packs. You know you love them. His last chance. A missing politician. The case reopened. The number one Scandi crime sensation. From the screenwriter of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. The Keeper of Lost Causes. In cinemas July 31. So far we've talked about stem cell treatment uh, in Australia. Christy, I wanted to talk to you because you travelled to Russia to have a bone marrow stem cell transplant to try and stop your multiple sclerosis. Um, and your story was recently featured on 60 Minutes. We have some footage of you before and after your treatment. Let's have a look at that. Um, and you might want to just tell us about that. So your mobility was limited here? It was, I'm getting upset watching it. It was very limited. Um, that was my day to day, that was me after. <laughs> um, so after, obviously my hair's missing there. Um, that was me after I got back from Russia. I could get back into exercise and no longer needed um, mobility devices. Tell us what you had done in Russia. What was involved? Um, I had um, a um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, which is essentially um, the same as a bone marrow transplant that they've been doing for cancers for many, many years. Um, and it involved... Um, stimulating the bone marrow so that they could collect it and then chemotherapy and uh, reinfusion of the stem cells to reboot my immune system. The whole idea behind it is that um, MS is widely accepted to be a hematologically rooted autoimmune disease. So the idea behind it is to stop that autoimmune process with the chemotherapy and rebuild a brand new immune system that no longer attacks your your brain and your spinal cord. And why did you have it done in Russia? Because I couldn't get into Sydney. So I applied um, to all of the reputable facilities I could find overseas, the ones that had contributed to clinical trials and who I knew were good. John, you're doing the only trial in Australia for the, on this kind of treatment. How experimental do you think it is for MS patients? Well, I think the, the rationale is, is solid, but there is no randomised trial in MS, I can say up front, as opposed to other conditions. Um, we initiated a trial at St Vincent's in, this is our fourth trial, but in 2010, including multiple sclerosis, given that by that stage we felt there was enough evidence to start looking at it. So we've treated nine patients, and, and it has been difficult to uh, include all the patients that we'd like to include, but... For us, we felt, first of all, we wanted to make sure it was safe. So when you hear Christy's story about, mm. about going and you see that footage, what, what's your reaction to that? Well, I, I suppose I'd like to be able to offer Christy that in Australia and we did have a conversation before she went. And, um, but so she wanted to be in your trial? Yes. yes? Yeah, and you, and you, you didn't well, no, include her? Well, the way it's been approved by our ethics committee is that the patients have to have failed multiple lines of therapy. And that's pretty standard, really. When you think about this, is a, this is a procedure that has a 5% chance of dying. And so we only accept patients that neurologists feel have no other therapeutic options. So you thought she hadn't tried enough other Well, uh, I have to be abided by the ethics committee. And so I, I, by, the, by the way the trial was set up, I couldn't accept her in the trial. And Christy, why did you leapfrog that process of trying the other drugs and trying the other procedures? Uh, I found a number of studies which showed um, a median success rate of around 80%, but um, a success rate of over 90% in the patients who had early intervention, HSCT. So you wanted to get in I early. wanted to get in and I wanted to have the high success rate. Um, and I didn't want to waste time. I was... I was out of work. I couldn't work as an ED nurse anymore. 
So um, I didn't want to waste years of becoming more disabled and trialling multiple drugs with side effects and risks. Mm -hmm. I, I want you to, yeah. to talk to one another here because <laughs> so, I'm, really inter yeah. I'm really interested in this because, yeah. you know, we for did Chris, talk to each we other. We did. I'm sure uh, you did. did. I was actually sure very surprised because before I went to Russia, uh, Dr Maud did give me the privilege of a, of a phone call that was lengthy and um, he was very sympathetic and I, you know, I was very frustrated and um, we, we discussed that, that there were some trials in which early intervention patients did better and he explained his, his, his position in, in having to, tr to treat the most disabled. Um, you know, so it was a good co phone conversation but obviously um, I, I would have preferred to have stayed in Australia. Yeah. See, this is interesting to me because in all these stories, there's the meeting of science and the patient, you know, and you've got the patient saying, I want to try something. I've, mm. got a, I've got a disease, you know, that I am concerned about the development of. I want to move fast. I want to mm. do something mm. quickly, which is really understandable. But, Jenny, if we'd gone in quickly 15 years ago and done people early and some of them had died then everyone would say we haven't followed due process. And so, you know, there, there's two sides to the story. You've got to balance the need for science versus the human condition. And how you know. do you all think that balance is going at the moment? <laughs> well, it's not going very well. I mean, when I undertook my stem cell transplant, I made sure that it was a clinical trial mm. in the public system and under the review of an ethics committee. I, you know, heaven forbid we should find a doctor out there practising with some god complex and we have all of these things set up to protect us, and, and self-regulation in the medical profession is not good, Jenny. Ralph, your response to that? Because you are able to just do this, aren't you? I mean, you don't have to prove to anyone that you, that you, you know, have scientifically examined the whole process. Sometimes we practice medicine and we see things happen, and we say, oh, why did that happen? Mm -hmm. And if I do it again, will it happen again? And, and quite often, we really don't know why we have got some improvement. But just because we don't know the science behind it doesn't mean to say that it doesn't work. Response? Well, that, that, that comes, I mean, there is... That, that's the definition of pseudoscience right there. We just heard the definition of pseudoscience. But science isn't that's absolute either. Science, that is science isn't definitive. Sales. Science isn't always definitive either. Absolutely not. Uh, absolutely. Science is not always definitive, and uh, we can never speak in absolutes. But what we can be clear about is whether there's a benefit. And the only way to do that is with a placebo-controlled, randomised, often crossover uh, trial, a technically approved and well-regulated trial that's then published, subject to review and replicate it elsewhere. If cowboys have activities in their own rooms and do things that aren't being supervised and certainly not uh, intended or approved by the TGA, the activities that are occurring in a number of doctors' premises were not intended by the exemption order. So cowboys? Absolutely. Are there cowboys in this room? Absolutely, I'm afraid so. This is an unproven therapy for which people are taking money, and I take exception to that. But it's easy just to sit there and go, oh, if you were the one sitting in a wheelchair or couldn't be yourself or you couldn't do anything with your kids or couldn't stand up, what would you do? So, thank you. Would, you be, would you be, um, OK, uh, this is the law and this is how it all works? Would you not just go, I'm going to try something? I, take, I have no pleasure in being placed in the position that I find myself tonight. Um, uh, overall uh, and above everything uh, must be compassion and respect for individuals to decide on their own course. And I find myself after 25, 30 years devoting myself to making certain that stem cells and gene therapy one day will be safely and properly administered to people, I find myself in an impossible situation appearing to be saying, don't do it. But everything takes so long. They do and these money. trials and they take like 20 years. And no money for clinical trials in Australia. But are stem cells a solution yes. for everything? We just talk about stem cells as though they're a silver bullet. Mm. And I think that's where we have to take a step back. And that's why we need clinical trials. We need to understand whether HSCT will work for MS. We, don't, we can't just lump everything together and think that stem cells are going to save everything. Megan, you, you've looked at patient expectations around stem cell therapy, haven't you? What have you found? Well, in our research, we interviewed Australians who've been over feel really good about having done that, having gone overseas. And I think this, the feeling of empowerment to feel as though they have tried all options, even though there wasn't necessarily a, a physical improvement, they felt better for having gone. It, it gave them hope. Mike, you have MS. Yes. Have, have you been 
tossing up what to do and thinking about, I mean, when you see Christie's story, yeah. for example, yeah. or when you hear about these treatments, what, what's been your response? Um, I guess I'm a little bit more sceptical. Um, one thing I would ask Christy is, how long had you been diagnosed, Christy, when you, or had, you had MS when you had your treatment? I've had MS for a long time, but I went on undiagnosed for a long time. It took a severe t deterioration for me to actually go into the GP and say, I think I have MS, right. refer me to a neuro. Yeah. Um, but I, I, in hindsight, I, I had um, blindness in my eye in 2007. My history is extensive, and that's a common misconception after mm. 60 minutes is that I got MS one day and went and had a stem cell transplant. It's, it's I was I diagnosed it, yeah. and then had a stem cell transplant very quickly because I did nothing but research for six months and, and called mm. good doctors and spoke to reputable people. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I had MS for a long time. Jodie, you have MS too. Yes. And you're waiting to hear if you get into John's trial, is that I right? Am. I am hoping I get into John's trial because I'd love to come um, have we treatment in Sydney. Yes, that. I was going to say, you could do um, a very good opportunity for now. some <laughs> lobbying here. What have you done in the meantime, though, while you're waiting? Um, well, I've actually had MS for diagnosed for 14 and a half years. It's been a, it's been a yearly relapse for me and I've been through every single disease modifying, modifying drug that's available on the market. And now, I've, I mean, that's including chemotherapy over two years, which was amazing for me and put me into a, a remission of two to three years. Now I'm at the point where I've got nothing left to lean on and I need something, I need, I need some hope and a light at the end of the tunnel. I saw the 60 minute program. This was about Christy going About to Christy. Russia. Uh, I was alerted to it by a lot of friends and relatives. Um, when I watched it, I was skeptical at first because, you know, you hear about these miracle cures. So have you booked in to go to Russia? I'm booked in to go to Russia in January because I have, well, I'm trying to get into Sydney. Um, but no pressure, John. No, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> um, and what is, no money, what is the quality of your... I'll pay you. Yeah, <laughs> that's the issue. I have 80 people, 80 Australians going to Russia in the next 18 months. 80 people that I've helped with applications and I've uh, spoke, spoken... I've, I've responded to 37,000 emails in four months. Uh, and I have 12,000 in my account right now that are not replied to. How much does it cost? It costs 40,000 US plus expenses, airfares and carers and, and that sort of thing. How do you know it was the transplant that, that, that well, resulted here's the in your improvement? From February till I arrived in Moscow in August, I got progressively worse. I tried um, um, uh, steroids in hospital, they didn't work. I just kept getting worse and worse and more disabled. Um, after I returned from Moscow, I waited um, at least four months uh, to have an MRI because I didn't want anyone to say it was the steroids I I interfering with my MRI report. All of my lesions are smaller and two are no longer visible on MRI. They cannot find them. And These are lesions in your brain? Lesions in my brain. And um, a placebo effect cannot remove... MRI lesions or shrink the ones that are there. Do you think there could be another explanation though for why you've improved since you went to Russia? I mean, do you no. think there could be... Because MS um, symptoms can wax and wane, can't they? They can, I mean, they can wax come and, and wane, go. But, but they in usually cases, wax and wane all for at the most maybe two months. Is it better for you the earlier you go before... Obviously Some of the no, data so, that I found but said over yes. Here, it's basically... The you've got to be... At, you've yeah. got to be at death's door, then we might have a look at you. That's right. So and the, that the facility that's doing the stage three clinical trials, they have trial criteria that's very similar. They want, they want people to have failed these, these uh, drugs, but they also have a non-trial acceptance policy. And I was accepted off trial. I'm fine to be off trial. But I just want the right to be treated. But it's $200,000 to do that with that's the Chicago fine. group. So and, that's why I went with it. But so what I'm trying to do, so you talk about the difference between compassion and science. What I'm trying to do is, I don't want to accept the $200,000. What I want to do is go through the appropriate channels, and I have, through the bureaucracy, and it goes to a health minister's meeting on the 18th of July. I've wrote a document. I'm trying to get it done so that we have an even playing field and not everyone has so to pay that too this, much. So this will so be I available can, in Australia. And people paying money for it, I don't think is the right way to go. If I can so get you, the so authorities to pay for it, I would love that. 
So does that mean you have evidence it works? Scientific evidence it works? There is, there is plenty of evidence that it works, correct, but we need the randomised trial and that's why we have committed at St Vincent's to do the randomised trial and it will cost us to do that, but we want to do it because we want to know that the science is correct. Do, we, do, you, do you understand how frustrating Absolutely. that is for people who don't care who pays? I don't care if I pay or I don't care if the taxpayer pays. I just want my wife to be better again. Correct. I, do, I, I, I listen to it daily and I do feel for people. Right. Why in the trial, why do we have to be um, at a certain disability range? I mean, what is the point of waiting, say, for to, to be non-mobile before you get the treatment to halt your MS? I don't understand the logic behind that. Nobody in their right mind wants to halt their MS mm. when they're already in a wheelchair. Because there are therapies that may work, and I mean, but I've been on every clearly. one of your every thera thera other therapies. Absolutely. So you may be eligible, um, but there are people who may have may go on to interfere on, for instance, and be fined for many years. But it sounds like there's, reason, there's a reasonable basis for believing that this procedure should be available in Australia that's being offered, that, yes. that Christie had to go to Russia for. Yes, Jenny, I hope the State Health Minister is watching. Ralph, back in your surgery in Sydney, what other conditions are you treating with fat stem cell therapy? I think that uh, osteoarthritis responds very well and I think that migraine is another disease that also shows an, an extremely promising response rate and that's uh, something that I would like to progress. You're also treating though um, spinal cord injury, MS, Parkinson's, motor neuron disease, stem cell therapy, is that right? I have had some patients with Parkinson's disease and um, I think that Overall, I'm not convinced that it's the best treatment to have. I well, you've treated Jeffrey up the back. Yes, yes. And I'm very happy with his response, but I think that he's a little bit unusual. Jeffrey, how, how did the treatment go? I had the, the initial <coughs> the extraction of the stem cells in December 2011. Within two weeks, I noticed uh, an improvement in my uh, con connectivity with the world around me. My vitality um, and I subsequently had uh, top-up treatments several times and the tremor in my right arm was almost pretty well disappeared and n neither of them have come back. I've since written a, a novel which has been published so my cognitive uh, abilities didn't deteriorate any more than they do in any other 70 year old. Uh, I'm happy I had the, had the treatment. OK, Martin, your reaction? Um, well, we don't really know what would happen to stem cells under those circumstances, or th they're not pure stem cells, obviously. It's a crude preparation of fat. Um, it seems unlikely to me uh, that they would reach the brain and be able to benefit Parkinson's disease. John, your, your reaction? I couldn't be more thrilled for Jeffrey. I couldn't be more thrilled for Christy. Uh, so without wanting to dramatise it then, Jenny, you know, a person who might with MS have a life expectancy of 10 or 15 years being with their children and seeing their kids grow up might die with a 5% or higher risk mm. in the first three months following that autologous transplant. But the worldwide risk rate is about 1% of treatment-related mortality. The doctor who did mine is done, has done 280 transplants with zero deaths. So we have to look at for different facilities and we can't just say it's 5% because that's absolutely not true. It may be 5% in Sydney, I don't know, but it's not 5% in every location in the world. OK. Donald, you, you wanted to say something. Did you want to join in this discussion? I, I suppose I wanted to address an earlier comment about cowboys and for fear of being labelled as, as a cowboy, I want to point out that I have to be referred patients by other doctors. I have to write back to those doctors explaining uh, my rationale for, for treatment and what I've told the patients. I also work under the auspices of a, a medical advisory committee of the hospital. Uh, that I, I perform this procedure at. So uh, we have many treatments in the medical field uh, which would be deemed experimental that are, are commonplace, and I, I can name quite a few, certainly in musculoskeletal medicine. I want to talk a little bit about the placebo effect because I don't think we can 
you know, have this discussion without, dis without talking about that. Um, Donald, in the absence of those studies, those, those trials that actually do things like establish what happens when people are given a placebo, how can you know that some of the outcomes you get aren't the placebo effect? That people aren't just responding to any no kind doubt, of treatment? Please. There's no doubt that there's a strong placebo effect. There have been other trials that have shown that uh, uh, the more that you do, the more that you interfere, the more that you uh, treat someone, the greater the placebo effect. Um, I suppose when you look at things like cartilage regrowth, uh, changes in biomarkers, so for example where uh, we can look and, and measure uh, products of cartilage degradation in placebo group and in treatment groups and there was a difference in that uh, North Shore uh, trial. Martin, what about where things are measurable? Can you, like the growth of cartilage, can you eliminate the placebo effect with well, treatments? Well, I think it's important to recognise that there may be a, a placebo effect but also physically manipulating the tissue, putting a needle in, may do things we don't really appreciate uh, uh, that, that could be a consequence of those manipulations. So that's why it's important to know precisely what is causing the beneficial effect. So the treatment has to be matched as closely to a control as possible. Jeffrey, have you wondered about the placebo effect with treatment or not? Yes, I have. And my view was if it works in me, and I don't care if it's placebo effect or... What it is. What it is. <laughs> to make, if, if I feel better, uh, it's now three and a half years, and I do f still feel better. I still enjoy red and white wine. I can do things that uh, I wasn't able to do prior to 2011. Kerry, did you wonder about it? I don't think it even crossed my mind because I'd been in pain for so many years while I was playing and then since retiring, I retired 10 years ago, um, that <laughs> I've tried everything and I've tried everything. I've had injections in my joint before. I've had... Had a lot of treatment. I've had a lot of treatment and um, it took a while for me to really believe that it had worked. Um, it took six months for me to really start to test it. Mm. And now I'm running on the sand and I didn't even run on the sand when I was playing. Ross, what about, what about you? You were a bit more sceptical about... No, look, I, I, there's no doubt about the placebo response. A study came out last year about arthroscopy for osteoarthritis, and they did sham arthroscopy and a proper arthroscopy where they tidy up the joints. There was absolutely no difference in benefit with a significant placebo response by just having the anaesthetic and having the ejection. Matt, you've also been overseas for stem cell treatment for your spinal cord injury. Where did you go? I went to Germany. Now, that clinic you went to has since been shut down, is that right? Closing in on Baghdad. Iraq's coming storm. But can ISIS be stopped? Dateline next on SBS One. I'm Captain Ray Holt. I'm your new commanding officer. Robot Captain, engage. Is that what you think? Hey! hey. New Captain Alert. That's a terrible robot voice. Yep. I'd like you to finish. Me. Start. Robot. Like you, we're big on entertainment. Only Telstra lets you choose the big movies, the big game replays, must-see TV like Falling Skies, The Real Housewives of Orange County and Graceland, plus fast broadband and home phone. Get all this with the Entertainer Super Bundle M for only $120 a month. And for a limited time, new home broadband customers get a bonus $200 gift card. At AHM Health Insurance, we've combined your separate extras limits into a single annual limit for you to use however you want on the included extras. Use 100%. Waste nothing. We are AHM. Switch today. Come home to King Furniture this winter. Sail on now.
Opportunity beeps at Mercedes-Benz until July 31. With incentives and extraordinary prices available on a wide range of demonstrator vehicles, there's a model to suit everybody. So when Opportunity beeps, be sure to answer. At Shell, we're working hard to broaden the world's energy mix. Supplying natural gas for the generation of electricity with around half the CO2 emissions of coal. Producing biofuel made from renewable sugarcane with our partner in Brazil. And here in Australia, finding ways to fuel our future. Let's broaden the world's energy mix. Let's go. Why do these eyes of mine cry? Don't they know it's the end of the world? It ends With so many new dramas on our channels, for our customers, new drama never ends. For our drama offer, call 131787 today. Foxtel, experience better. Perry, uh, you're hopeful that stem cell therapy eventually might help your spinal cord injury. Um, what sort of treatment have you had so far? Yeah, um, I've taken part in a clinical trial um, with embryonic, human embryonic um, stem cells in India. Um, it was a trial for people that were incurable and terminal. Um, and I've been doing that for um, a few years now uh, and seen functional recovery that, um, you know, I haven't uh, been able to explain, you know, by Australian, my Australian doctors, so, you know... What sort of things? Mainly my um, function of my diaphragm, so I was injured playing um, rugby 20 years ago. Um, my life expectancy was uh, 10 years post-injury because I was fully ventilated, so about... 14 years after my injury, I went to India to get treatment and um, started to get regain function in my diaphragm. The last series of treatment, I started to get a bit of function in my right shoulder, you know, so... Has it been as much as you'd hoped in terms of a...? Um, well, I went into the treatment thinking, um, you know, any improvement would be amazing because there is no cure for a spinal cord injury at the moment. Um, you know, that's pretty obvious. Mm. So, how many times have you been? Uh, five, six times, probably, yeah. And how many uh, more times do you think you'll go? Um, well, at this stage, it's all about, um, you know, money, because I have to pay to take part in that clinical trial, um, and it's not cheap. So. so, you have to pay in addition to the travel costs you have to yeah, pay as yep, well? How much yeah. has it cost you so far? Um, you know, be the, within the vicinity of maybe... Um, I'm just gonna, just gonna get me in my wheelchair. Um, <laughs> um, probably a quarter of a million dollars, I'd say. Quarter of a million? Yep. Mm. How do they administer the treatment, Perry? Uh, IV injection. Um, IM. This is embryonic stem this is, cells. Yeah, human embryonic. Um, intermuscular, uh, epidural, all sorts of. Mm. Yep. Thank you. Martin? What's your view of this treatment? There are trials now ongoing of embryonic stem cell derived products in spinal cord injury and we don't know how those trials will turn out. Matt, you've also been overseas for stem cell treatment for your spinal cord injury. Where did you go? I went to Germany and um, I went there because they used my own stem cells. So the nature of the treatment was very different, yeah? Yeah, yep. Yeah. I didn't want to put something in my body that wasn't my own. And what were the results for you? Yeah, not much. Nothing really happened. But <clears> if <throat> I didn't go, I'd still be sitting in here going, what about if I did go? Now, that clinic you went to has since been shut down. Is that right? Yeah, yeah I think so. They um, put some cells into a young child's brain and they didn't work out. And the child died? Yeah. So where has that left you now in terms of what you prepared to try? Um, now I wouldn't really try anything unless I was like a proven deal. So what's it like for you listening to this discussion tonight? Yeah, I, I see everyone's point of view, but you know, going public and you worry about wetting your pants, 
and as a man, you know, it's just it's devastating. If there's only a touch of hope, you'll go. And that's never going to change. I can speak to someone who's had a spinal cord injury tomorrow and tell him my experience, but he's going to have some hope because where he is at the moment is probably not the best place he'd want to be, so, yeah. Perry, um, there was a lot of hype around stem cell treatment for spinal cord injuries some years ago. There was a lot of hope, a lot of you know, promise in that, mm. um, particularly during the period that Christopher Reeve was championing it and calling for more research funds and so on. Has there been much progress, do you think, in, in the research in that time? Well, there's, you know, there's a lot more. Well, there's clinical trials happening, you know, all over the world now. So, you know, we, ev we eventually got to a point where it started to come to fruition, that, you know, um, things were happening, there was momentum being gained. So I, th I believe that, you know, we're on the right track now. Um, 